Christ. We see that on June 12th, we're going to vote as, as church members following the second service for or against Scott Alley. Um, just to be clear, this works the same way our budget works. So if you haven't come to us to tell us that you've got a problem and you vote no, it, how can it count? Right? The way we're supposed to do this biblically is we're supposed to go to someone with our issues. So come to us. If there's a problem, we'll give you an opportunity to, to talk with elders and Scott about it. I don't expect there to be any, but if there are, we're, this is the process. And so June 12th, you can vote together, and then um, the next week, we're going to have an installation service. So that's the 19th. We're going to have a meal together, and we're going to install Scott Alley as an elder. So that's a little bit of what's going on. With that in mind, I want to invite Scott up. Scott Alley. You can read a little bit about Scott on the insert in your bulletin, but Scott's going to come up and share with us his testimony. And if I can just say, uh, Scott and his family have been very faithful. One of the qualifications of an elder that's not a character qualification in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 is ability to teach. That doesn't mean preach. It just means the ability to rightly share the truth about Jesus using the Scripture. And Scott has been faithfully doing that in our Finders class for a while, teaching people about Christ and worldview, how their worldview can be shaped into what the Scripture teaches us is right. So, brother, I know you're a little nervous, but you're going to do great, right? So let me hand this to you. You can use this if you want to. There you go. Well, I'm going to do the total uh, amateur thing here and just totally just read it right off the paper and hope I don't sound ridiculous. <laughs> there you go. Okay. So first and most importantly, I am a child of God. I uh, grew up in a church. I'm sorry, I didn't grow up in church, though I did briefly go to church as a child with my aunt. And uh, as I described in today's bulletin, when I was 10 years old, my sibling, Sean, my only sibling, he was five years old, was diagnosed with aplastic anemia, which is a, a very serious blood disorder, very similar to leukemia. They told us that he didn't have much of a chance of survival without a bone marrow transplant. Uh, his main hope was to find a, a bone marrow donor, and uh, it was difficult to get a match back then. There wasn't uh, a big bone marrow donor registry like there is now. You know, we've got lists out there. Uh, his, his main hope was to find a bone marrow donor um, in the family. <clears throat> uh, thankfully, I was a perfect match. So before we had to leave for Johns Hopkins Hospital, uh, which was only one of two places in the entire country that was capable of doing that procedure, uh, that was 1985. So we would go with my aunt to her church to get prayed over. Uh, we enjoyed going there. We learned a lot about Jesus in our Sunday school class. Ultimately, our, our prayers were answered and Sean <clears throat> survived his disease. So going through this ordeal and, and having a positive result uh, really helped to strengthen my belief in God. Uh, we didn't go to church for very long with my aunt, but. But I always remembered those Bible lessons that I learned, and they helped to navigate me in my uh, school years. I always knew that God was with me, and that uh, He helped, and that helped keep me in line. Uh, after I could drive myself, I started going back to that church again for a short time until I started working a, a retail job and had to work most Sundays. I was still always a good kid. Um, I was afraid to get in trouble. Never tried any drugs. Uh, I did go through a, a period of drinking in college with our friends. And um, in my early 20s, I started working in a machine shop where a coworker would um, sometimes spend his break times reading a Bible. That intrigued me. This was the first time I'd ever really seen anybody read a Bible outside of a church building, just in, in normal life. We eventually started talking about the Bible and having many God conversations together. Sometimes over a beer in his apartment. <laughs> he was a deeply flawed person, but God used him to spark a fire within me. 
So this is a period of time that I consider my true salvation. For this is when <clears throat> I found like an actual personal relationship with my Savior Jesus. And couldn't get enough of the word. I started attending that church again. And, and this is about the time that I met my wife. Which brings me to point two. Secondly, I am a husband of one wife. As 1 Timothy 3.2 instructs. In 1996, I started playing around in this new thing they called the internet. Actually, at that time, it was just America Online. We didn't, we didn't know the difference between America Online and the internet. We, we thought America Online wasn't the internet. So I met Erica in a Christian chat room. And this is basically the only thing people used the internet for at that time, was just chat rooms to talk with people on the other side of the country. Uh, at that time, of course... Most people joked that the only people on the internet were ex-murderers anyway. <clears throat> My friends used to tease me and say that this girl that I was talking to in Texas was probably just some creepy old man that was sending me pictures <laughs> of his niece or something like that. <laughs> well, there's only one way to find out. I'm going to have to fly down there and meet her myself. Uh, but before I could do that, her dad made me fill out this long theological questionnaire <laughs> to determine whether I was a real Christian or not before he would give me permission to come down there. Yeah, I appreciate that now. Eventually, I, con I convinced him. I flew down to Texas, and indeed, Erica was a pretty young lady, not a creepy old man. So long story short, we liked each other pretty good. And two years later, we were married in Texas, and I drug her up here to Michigan. It had to be a God thing to bring us together for a chance encounter like that, a thousand miles away. And uh, so thirdly, I am a father. This was another long journey. Uh, we had a long journey to get to be parents. We struggled with infertility for many years. Uh, we always believed that God could bless us with children, but would he? Uh, maybe we needed to help him. So after about four years of trying to conceive, including infer infertility treatments with doctors, we decided to adopt. So we were almost immediately chosen by a mother who was going to give us her child. Um, we quickly set up a nursery in our house. We started to prepare for a baby. And it was only a, a few weeks until our baby was born, and we were bringing her home from the hospital. It was only a couple more weeks when we received a phone call instructing us that we needed to bring this baby back to the adoption agency because the mother had changed her mind. She wanted her back. So, of course, we were devastated. And what do we do now? Can we just run away? Do we need to return all of our baby shower gifts? We, you know, what, what's the protocol here? We've never, we've never been through something like this before. So we could do nothing but comply and pray. Shortly after, we asked the agency if we could maybe try foster care with the adoption, um, with the intention of adoption. They said that they could probably fit us with kids that were just most likely to have their parents' rights um, terminated. And uh, we very quickly were given two little girls. We had them in our house, they were siblings two-year-old and a 10-month-old, and this was not God's plan either. We could soon see that the girls were going to end up going back to their mom also, uh, but at least this time we had time to prepare ourselves for turning our kids back in. So we ended up having them for almost exactly one year, and this is when we moved to Texas. Uh, we we uh, decided we weren't going to pursue anything with doctors or adoption until we just saved up enough money to give in vitro fertilization a try. So that's what we did. And God bless this attempt. And in the process gave us actually one of the best icebreaker lines we could have ever imagined. So we'd like to tell people <clears throat> that our kids are actually triplets, but they were born two years apart. <laughs> So they were all conceived at the same time, but Ben and Evelyn spent a year and a half in the freezer. <laughs> and we actually have pictures of them as little single-celled zygotes in a Petri dish. So we can't wait to break those out at the weddings. <laughs> uh, 
<clears throat> During this time of gearing up for this in vitro, my brother became sick again. This time, it was a very aggressive cancer and took his life at only 31 years old. With this loss fresh in our hearts, we decided to name our firstborn, Sean Evan, in his memory. So we were not always a very good Christian example through these trying times. But looking back on it now, we can see the fingerprints of God. We can see that he was teaching us a few things along the way <clears throat> and showing us that we were not really trusting him. We can now be truly thankful that we had these failures along the way because they, <clears throat> if we had not had those failures, then of these kids that were previously in our house, then we probably wouldn't have gone through with the uh, in vitro and have our own three biological children. So, that's a little bit about me. Uh, I welcome you to review 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 and a few other places that the Bible talks about a qualified elder and prayerfully measure me up. In a couple weeks, you can cast your vote to determine if you'd like me to serve in this capacity. And if you should vote yes, I ask that you would shower me in prayers and that I might do a good job and pray for Erica and the kids as we embark on this new adventure. Great job. Great job, Scott. Thank you so much. Um, I think you see his heart. You see his heart, you see his love for Jesus and the story that God has formed over the years. And uh, elders are called by God to do a couple of things. And so I want to invite you to take this home with you. You should have it in the bulletin. If you didn't get a bulletin, take, take one as you leave and really take a look at what it is that elders are called by God to do. And so you saw this man has a heart, a tender man. And we're looking for men who want to love God's people well. And I'm confident that Scott Alley is one of those men. We're going to transition here, and I want to bring up my brother, Phil. Come on up, brother. <laughs> Phil is also in our pond, and um, he is going to preach for us this morning. And I just want to pray over you before you get started. Okay. Holy Father, thank you for Phil. Thank you for what you are doing in his life and in his family. Thank you for his passion for you, Jesus, his passion for your word. Father, I thank you that it doesn't matter who preaches your word, because your word is inspired. It is inerrant. It is authoritative in our life. And when we teach it, it does not return void. And so this morning, as my brother Phil preaches your word, Lord, I ask that you would do what you would always do. And so we pray this in confidence, that you would work in and through the preaching of your word so that we would all grow more and more in love with Christ and in obedience to him. Take away his fear, calm his anxiety, and give him your peace and your confidence. Lord, we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Take it away. Good morning, everybody. Okay. Okay. So uh, just as uh, Scott did, I got some paper here with everything that I'm going to say on it. I got nine pages. Um, so. Preach it, brother. Okay, so I wanted to start off with saying uh, this past Wednesday at youth group, during our small group time, I was with the middle school boys, and this is the second time in I think almost two years, year and a half that I've been youth leader that I was sat in with the, the middle school boys. Um, so they had asked me this Wednesday if I'd come in and sit in with them for small group and I was in there with the high school boys already and sitting down and then Sam had came walking in to sit in with the high school boys so I was like well here's my opportunity to go in with the middle school boys so I walked into the middle school boys and uh, got to sit in on a small group with them and uh, we always started off by asking the boys if they have any ups and downs 
um, that they want to share this from the previous week. Uh, then after that, we go into a few questions that are related to Sam's message. During our uh, questions, we were going over um, John uh, Barber. He's he was the one leading the, the questions, asking the questions and everything. And uh, one of the young men, he was like whispering to me and doing his fingers like this and pointing to me like, Phil, what's your ups and downs? You know, um, so unfortunately we ran out of time and I wasn't able to tell him, well, hopefully the live stream is on and working and he can watch this um, and see what my ups were for this week. It was preparing this sermon, preparing this message, and God guided me to deliver what he wanted you guys to hear. Now, if you would have asked me three years ago if I would be a youth leader or if I would get up in front of the church to give a sermon, you would have got the answer I always gave to everybody. I don't have time. It was about two and a half years ago I said yes to God when I got asked to volunteer at a youth shooting event to run the fishing station. Little did I know that day that God was getting ready to use me in ways I would never think of. From becoming a youth leader to going on a mission trip to a third world country and leaving my family back home in the middle of a crazy pandemic to being in the elder pond today, to, to being in the elder pond to today. It wasn't until I was devoted to being open to God's will in my life that I was able to find out what true happiness is and what my purpose in this life is. And just as we sang this morning, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. My prayer is if you haven't decided, anybody in here hasn't decided to follow Jesus, I pray right now that today will be your day. If you uh, weren't here last week, um, a quick overview of uh, last week's sermon was uh, Acts 2, 1 through 41. It was the coming of the Holy Spirit. It came in like a mighty wind. Every believer was filled with the Holy Spirit that changed their tongues so they could share the gospel in every language. Non-believers tried to say they were drunk on new wine. Peter wasn't having that. Peter stood up boldly and gave a sermon denying their implications and explaining that what had truly happened was the Holy Spirit coming upon them and how prophets had foretold of this. The people that received Peter's sermon were baptized that day and the church added about 3,000 souls. If you were not lucky enough to catch Pastor Josh's sermon last week, I, I uh, hope that you can go on the Facebook page and check it out because it was really, it was an awesome sermon. Here at Crossroads, we believe it is important to honor the Word of God by standing while we read. So if you are able Please stand with me as we read Acts 2, verses 42 through 47. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. We are going to talk about the, the first church after the Holy Spirit came, the first Spirit-filled church. They devoted, they devoted themselves to four things, the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, 
breaking of bread, and prayer. The believers were devoted or completely committed to these four things. The new believers were living different after the coming of the Holy Spirit from what they were living previously. I tell the boys in youth group, we are to live different than non-believers. And that non-believers should see something different in us. When I started devoting my life to Christ, I received a backwards compliment from my grandfather, who has always been my role model. One day, while sitting with him, he told me, I seem to be becoming quite the Bible thumper. Previously, I would have taken that as an insult, but as I took his words, in his words, a smile came across my face. I thought that was pretty awesome. I thought that was a pretty awesome name to be called and that I must be doing something right. My favorite verse in the whole Bible is Romans 12:2. Do not conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We're called to look different. Every one of us. When we give ourselves to Christ, it just happens. We look different than the non-believers. And I'm living proof of that. The new believers were living different than the rest of the world. And that's because they were devoting themselves to God. So they devoted themselves to also, the first thing that they devoted themselves to was the apostles' teaching. Just as the apostles had been instructed by Jesus, so they passed along that instruction to the new believers. The new believers had to have been so eager to learn from the apostles, knowing that they walked in fellowship with Jesus himself for three years. The new believers were living in the word of God every day. One of the books I gained information on while studying was uh, written by R.C. Sproul's, his book on Acts. He stated that the early church was a Bible studying church, steadfastly, continually devoted to devouring the word of God that came from the apostles. Wouldn't that be amazing if we were known for someone who devours the word of God? I mean, how awesome would that be? They were not just going to church on Sunday hoping to get filled up until next week. And neither should we. They were filling themselves with God all the time. It says in verse 46, day by day attending the temple. We need to be in the word ourselves every day. So let's open our Bibles and dig into the Lord's word. A wise gentleman once told me, And most everybody here knows this gentleman. I was in a discipleship group with him. And he told me it only takes three days of being out of the word. Only three days. It's all it takes before we revert back to our old lives. Some of you might know this man as Pastor Steve Malson. He had a huge... Pastor Steve had a huge push in why I'm standing here today. The Bible is an instruction manual for our lives. Everything comes with an instruction manual on how to operate it. Why wouldn't we have one for our life? The first church was lucky as they were learning directly from the apostles. We must be careful who we have teaching us. There are a lot of false doctrines out there. It is very easy to be led astray. In Timothy, in 2 Timothy Verse 4, or 2 Timothy 4, verse 3, it warns us of this. It says, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. If you are ever in question about what someone is teaching you, uh, reach, please reach out to one of our elders. One of their jobs is to protect our congregation, the flock, from wolves. The second thing they uh, devoted themselves to was fellowship. And fellowship comes from the Greek word koinonia. 
Defined as holding something in common, it describes the unity of the spirit that comes from Christian shared beliefs, convictions, and behavior. Easily summed up as Christians doing life together, there are many ways to be in fellowship with one another, like joining a small group or discipleship group, but one of the most rewarding I have found is through volunteering in church ministry. My wife... My wife and I love the fellowship that comes with being youth leaders. We are making an impact in kids' lives, and they are making a huge difference in ours. Fellowship is friendship, but with a spiritual side to it. Like friendship, you cannot do fellowship alone. God wanted us together from the very beginning. Genesis 2 verse 18 says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. I love that we serve a God who cares because he sends us who we need in our lives to help us grow closer to him when we are obedient to his calling in our lives. Because God uses us mostly in the context of some type of fellowship, it is very unlikely that anyone would be hugely used to grow the kingdom if they, are, if they place themselves in isolation. That's right. Look at Jesus. He called his disciples to walk beside him and to do life with him. As we learned last week in Acts 2 verse 14, Peter was standing with the eleven when he gave his sermon because they were continuously involved in each other's lives. Did you guys know that bonds between believers are capable of developing to a degree of spiritual closeness that far surpass the limitations of natural human friendship? That's huge. That's huge. The bonds that we make here and with other believers can develop far greater than any other friendships. You will be amazed where Christian fellowship will lead you if you are willing to devote yourself to it. It may lead you into the middle of the wilderness with some of your best friends singing worship music with a 60-pound sack on your back like it did me two weeks ago during my hiking trip. The next thing they were devoted to was breaking of bread. This uh, is having a meal together or communion Breaking bread is a reference to the Lord's table and the taking of communion, which is mandatory for all Christians to observe. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23 through 26 says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is... For you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim that the Lord's death until he comes. We break bread in remembrance of Jesus. Um, for uh, in remembrance of what Jesus did on the cross. Jesus calls us to take communion as a new covenant to him. I think breaking of bread isn't simply a meal. It's more of a meaning. It's becoming one body in Christ, an unbreakable family bond, not with just one another, but also with God. Last but not least the fourth thing that they devoted themselves to was prayer. Prayer is huge. Prayer is really, it's huge. It is pouring out our hearts to God in praise, petition, confessions of sin, and thanksgiving. Jesus spent a lot of time in prayer. Jesus designated his house as a house of prayer, which it states in Matthew 21, verse 12 and 13. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple 
And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. If Jesus named his house as a house of prayer and the first church was devoted completely to prayer, then I would say we need to be praying all the time. We should pray with love, perseverance, and gratefulness and humble submission to God's will, knowing that for the sake of Christ, he always hears our prayers. A couple good references to why we should pray. Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. 1 John 5, 13 through 15. I write, this, I write these things to you, who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. It is crucial to pray all the time. When we wake up, throughout the day, before you eat, before bed, when you hear an ambulance driving down the road, even before you read the Bible so that you may accept it with faith, store it in your hearts, and practice it in your lives. Pray that God will remove all distractions and open your hearts to his will. Now that we have covered the four important things the first spirit-filled church devoted themselves to, let me, ask, let, let me ask you to think about what will you devote yourselves to? Now we will continue verse 43 through 47. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. In my life, I have seen firsthand just a couple times where people have sold all they had to grow the kingdom. The first was a man named Martin. He came to visit the youth group last year. He shared his testimony and how he sold everything and moved his family to Uganda, which at the time, he said, was the most dangerous and poor country in the world. He started a ministry that that bought children out of slavery and gave them a home. Through the ministry, they share the gospel with these children and are able to show them the love of Jesus. The second one being in Guatemala, a woman named Nancy Sheldon, who was here from America, she sold everything she had and she moved her family down to Guatemala to start Servant Ministries. That in Servant Ministries provides for the poor stricken mountain children there in Guatemala. While I was there on a mission trip last November, I was blessed to watch her baptize roughly 20 people, ranging in ages 8 to 74. It was amazing seeing all of them be baptized, but the one that really stuck out to me the most was a 74-year-old sun-wrinkled man with hands of stone being baptized. It just goes to prove that it is never too late to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Amen. Maybe God is not calling you to sell your things, but you can still do something to meet the needs of others.
By committing yourself to a body of Christ through church membership, you are contributing to the needs of others. By devoting yourself like the first uh, spirit-filled church did, I've learned when God calls you that you do not want to wrestle with him. If you are wrestling with the thought of accepting Jesus or being baptized, do not wait any longer. Talk to one of our elders. If you are wrestling with the thought of becoming a member, let this sermon be your confirmation that God wants us to commit to one another in membership. Talk to one of us today to make sure you are following God's will for your life. It is so important for us to come together and be involved in one another's lives. We should be praising God daily together through prayer and fellowship because God is good and deserves our praise. Amen. Amen. Today we covered Acts 2, verse 42 through 47. Although it is short, it is mighty in the instructions for our life. We should strive to be completely devoted to biblical teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer every day of our lives. Jesus called us, Jesus called us just as he called the apostles to spread the gospel. Our church mission statement is to love God, love one another, and make disciples. The only way to do that is through fellowship with one another. If you are not a member, we highly encourage you to become one. And that's the final page, y'all. okay let's uh let's pray father god i thank you for this opportunity to spread the gospel dear god i i I thank you for having a full house here today, dear God. And just, I pray that there's someone out there that heard your message and takes it to their heart. I pray that as people walk out the door today, that they are changed by what your message was today. Dear God, I just pray that you please allow people to be changed. I pray for all the people in this world that are mourning right now, I just pray that you please, 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 please bring peace to them. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.